you know, it helps a little bit, but the main thing is, is it unstable? And that's this thing. This is, if you go all the way to, uh, you get to the home page, and you go all the way over to the weather, that's over here, right? And then you go, this is the soaring forecaster. And then when you get there, you just look at what the weather is in San Jose. Okay, yeah, you get to the weather underground, San Jose, and then the temperature of the day, which is right here. High temperature of the day. This is today's, I guess, 70 degrees. And then you stick it, you get back to, uh, yeah, you go back there and you stick it in this little box, right? You put in 70 and you go forecast. And then you get something that looks like one of these things. What it does is it takes the data from the Oakland sounding, which happens at 1200 hours Zulu, which is either four or five o'clock in the morning, depending on whether we're on daylight savings or, uh, or standard time, and it plots the data. This is, this is the plot from the uh, Oakland sounding. What they do is they, up at Oakland, they just launch a balloon with a little instrument package that sends back temperature and uh, uh, altitude and a few other things, right? And then they track it with the radar, and so they can get the wind velocities aloft and all kinds of stuff like that. But the most important thing is the temperature profile. And this is the temperature profile we've got, right? This, this axis is the temperature, and then this axis here is the altitude. These are actually in feet, amazingly enough. And so what the thing does is it plots all that stuff, and then it takes the high temperature of the day, which is up here somewhere we can't see, and it says, okay, from that high temperature, if we take some air and just start raising it, as you raise the air, it expands, it cools off, the temperature goes down, and so you get this curve like this, a pretty straight curve, right? And so this is an inverted summer day. It's totally hopeless. Because what happens is that for the first, oh, maybe 500 feet, the temperature goes down, and then it gets warmer. You can see the temperature is going up and up and up, and so what happens is this air here in the afternoon gets heated up to this temperature. It kind of rises. As long as it's warmer than the air around it, it keeps rising, and it just rises until the air is no longer around it is no longer cooler than it is, and it stops. It doesn't go any further. And so it's going to go up to, what, 1,500 feet, and that's the end of the line. So that's a typical inverted, unsorable day. And they call it inverted because usually the temperature gets colder and colder and colder as you go along, right? And so you look at a sounding like that and you go, that's it. It doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing, how hard, whatever. It's not going to be sore. Uh, let's see. I think this one uh, was actually uh, this Sunday, last Sunday. Yeah, 19th, 19th February. February. Yes, this is Sunday, right? And so this one is... A, uh, if we can ever get it to like just calm down so we can look at it. This one here is kind of an iffy forecast, um, where you see there's there's no inversion, but the uh, this is this is the actual air that we've got, and then this is taking the high temperature of the day wherever it was, and okay if this air starts going up, it's going to probably end up going up to here, which is well that's pretty high that's 5,000 feet. But the thing is, we need a certain amount of thermal strength because you can't climb in a thermal that's just going up at two feet a minute. You know, the glider has a certain sink rate, so it's got to be better than your sink rate. And the other thing with, these, with this is that a lot of times if there's weather moving in or front moving in, it'll get more unstable as the day goes on. And um, since this stuff is from four or five o'clock in the morning, if you're flying in that same air, then these things are remarkably accurate. But if new, different air is moved in, then it could be different. And so this turned out to be Sunday, and yeah, it didn't look that good, but it was kind of on the iffy sort of thing. But actually, it turned out to be surprisingly good. It turned out to be worth a golden eagle, at least. <laughs> and so that was pretty good. Um, what is, and this, this over here gives you the wind directions. There's the directions there in degrees, and then there's the velocity in uh, knots, I guess. Yep. So, anyway, find another one. The other ones, I think, are a lot better. Um, okay. And one of, the, one of the good numbers here to look for is this, where is the minus three, right? And that's, 
that essentially, the minus three, what these numbers are, is the distance between, you know, where, where the uh, sounding is and where the projected temperature of the air that came up from the ground is. And minus three, a lot of times, is pretty close to the top of the lift. And this one looks, this one actually looks really good, because the minus three is way up at 4,500, and the winds are actually southerly. So this one, you see something like this, and it's like, okay, it's time to get out there. Um, you know, this is definitely a happening day. I'm trying to remember what what day that was. It was probably good. You will occasionally get days after cold front when the wind's north. It's totally inverted, but the lapse rate is so good that it still works. So it happened maybe once every year or two, and they're worth, you know, quitting your job and so, skipping your <laughs> wedding or something. So the, watch, the watch is above the inversion. You can stay well, on days like that, the inversion, the front is so strong that there is no inversion. And it would be generally sometime between April and June. And one diagnostic when that happens is solid wall-to-wall -wall thunderstorms over the Central Valley. It's that inverted. So actually... Is that stable? Is that yeah, that's stable. That is stable. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sense out of what you're describing. And, and what, I'm, what I'm thinking is that what you're describing really kind of sounds like the, the hopeless summer inversion. Yeah. Where it's like really kind of cool down here, or the hopeless winter inversion, you know, where it's like cold and kind of clammy down here in the landing zone. You drive up to the top of Ed Levin, and all of a sudden it's balmy and warm and nice. You, and maybe there's, you know, it's blowing up the hill two to five or something. You launch, you fly down, it's nice and warm, and then all of a sudden you feel like you've flown into the icebox. And those days are just totally not happening. Um, it needs to, you know, it needs to be something where it's kind of like moderate temperature down at the bottom. You get up to the top and you go, oh, it's kind of chilly up here. That's a good sign. You know? So, anyway, that's enough for lapse rate. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, there's a, there's a phone number for the road. Um, that's three five five two two zero zero, and then seven, and then six, and then you get the recording. Tells you whether the road's open. If they've bothered to update it. Um, the road's been good so far. Um, right now everything's so dry that it's going to take like a huge amount of rain to get everything wet enough so that it gets really out of hand. Um, you know, early in the season when things are dry, your truck could be up there, it could start raining, you know, you could send your truck down, everything will be fine. But later on in the season when everything's already saturated and already really damp, um, if your truck's on top and it starts raining, you may end up having your truck stuck in the park because what can happen is if everything's really damp and saturated, a few raindrops and the road gets too slippery, too slippery to drive, which is, that's no good. I've walked down in the rain because the truck was starting to just slither all over the road and the guy that was driving is going, I got lots of power, I can, I can drive, as he's sliding off into the ditch and it's like, okay, you can, I'll just walk down the hill. I don't care about getting wet. Um, so, the other thing um, about the rain, this is, a, this is a very little known fact about the rain, is everybody, typically if they're soaring, you know, the rain, the wind is coming from the southwest, right? So they're looking into the wind, right? There's the rain, you know, where's the rain coming? Well, what happens is the rain comes down from the north, right? Even though the wind is blowing southwest, the rain comes down from the north. If you watch the next rad radar, you know, to see what the rain is doing, you'll see that's what it does. And so the trick is, is you just keep an eye on the north, and when the rain gets to the Dumbarton Bridge Toll Plaza, right, Coyote Hills, kind of out there on the bay, it's time to dive out of the sky, land, and break down in a frenzy. Because if you do that, you'll be tying your glider on the truck just as it starts raining. And you'll see people flying up there and thinking, whoa, they're going to land in the rain and break down in the mud. Good for them. Um, that brings up the subject of how does your glider land when it's wet? Well, if you've got a regular uh, Dacron leading edge where the water just wets it and doesn't bead up, then you probably won't even notice the difference, right? You know, your glider's five or ten pounds heavier, so what? You know, it's not going to fly any different. On the other hand, if you have a mylar leading edge or a mylar sail, and you've got like, so the water turns into beads and it changes the surface texture completely, well, then it could fly weird. It could stall slug. prematurely. Say a slug. It could, it, it could have less performance. It could handle weird. It could do all kinds of stuff, you know? So, you know, yeah. if, 
Yeah, it's bad. If, you're, if you've got a mylar leading edge, yes. probably you want to land before it gets wet. Because um, you're taking your, I mean, my HP had a mylar leading edge, and I was, it was just a little bit wet, and I'm coming over the ditch, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to just float right into the spot and land, and everything's going to be fine. And the next thing I knew, the glider had stalled, I had flared, and I was running as hard as I could to keep from slamming it into the ground. And it was like, whoa, that was like really unexpected. That was ditch stuff. Yeah, yeah, you got to watch the ditch. Ditch is bad. Okay, um, how do I get a ride up? That's easy. Just have a driver. Forget having a truck. You don't need a truck. If you've got a driver, you've got to ride up the hill. That's, that's the way to do that, right? Unfortunately, drivers, drivers are harder to come by than trucks, as you may have noticed. Um, how do I avoid getting my truck stuck on top? Well, the thing is, is you need to get it down the hill. It's like if there's like likely to be rain in the afternoon and everything's kind of already really damp, maybe planning on doing a retrieve at the end of the day isn't really the best strategy um, because trucks have been caught up there. Um, okay, I'm just going down the list here. What's good? What's bad? Lapse rate is good. Uh, the other thing that can happen is that uh, um, it can be pretty changeable. I mean, it can be blowing, you know, 15 southwest can be really nice, and then it can decide to pick up the 20, 25, and blow really hard. Um, there was one infamous episode years ago where it, people were soaring and having a great time, and then it decided to pick up from like 15 to 18 up to 20 or 25, and then back, which is shift more southeasterly, and ended up with about six people didn't even make it back to the landing zone. They were kind of back by the towers when it shifted on them, and they, they all landed okay. Nobody got hurt, but it was kind of, a, kind of shocking that all of a sudden Ed Levin turned evil. Um, that's one of the things that can go wrong. Uh, one of the last times I flew there, down there, I basically hovered vertically the last 30 foot down to the ground. That was the first time I'd ever done that. It was blowing pretty hard. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Why should I land so long before sunset? Well, that's a historical thing. I think the main thing is the rangers don't want to be doing search and retrieve in the dark. And so years and years ago, they decided we have to all be landed and out of there an hour before sunset. And that's just the way it's been for a long, long time. Nobody's really decided that they want to go through all of the, the, the administration and... and who knows how much it would take to get that rule changed, or even if it could be changed. Nobody's really been able to, uh, to take that up. Um, how do I avoid scary landings in weird wind directions? All right, okay. This looks pretty familiar, or it should. Okay, yeah, this is, this is the Ed Levin LZ. Now I get to use my, this, this gives me a sense of godlike power. You know, I can say, okay, the wind is blowing. Right? Well, a typical, typical landing, the wind blows something like this, right? And so most people do an approach that kind of looks like that. Um, you know, that's pretty normal. Um, except when it's really soarable, what happens is the wind often tends to blow like this. And so people tend to do either a bunch of S turns here or kind of do approaches that kind of look like that. And that's, that's fine because you end up landing uphill into the wind, kind of up by the knoll, the wind socks somewhere like right there. The big secret with that is that there's, there's, the terrain up here is fairly mild. There's no really abrupt changes or sharp edges or anything, and no trees. And so typically, the wind in the landing zone is, you know, it can be a little bit bumpy, but it's not that bad. Um, one of the tricks, though, is if, it, if it's kind of blowing um, like this direction, uh, you definitely don't want to try landing downwind of these trees. I saw Justine do that one time and just like basically lost control of the glider and piled in. She didn't get hurt though. Didn't even bend anything. But the other thing that can happen is it can start blowing like this direction, right? Particularly if it's if it's kind of southeasterly. And when it's doing this, this all of this stuff, you know, the normal LZ is pretty much behind all these eucalyptus trees. And you don't want to land downwind of them, so you're you're kind of stuck with landing somewhere over here. You know, just keep an eye on the sock and make sure that whatever you're downwind of, it's kind of this nice smooth stuff. 
You know, you don't want to be landing downwind of any of these things because they're like big and tall and there'd be ugly rotors. Um, yeah, this is this is Ed Levin in all of its glory, right? There's, I can't, okay, here's the landing zone. This is from Google Earth, so it's like you're looking straight down from orbital altitudes, like, I don't know, 300 miles maybe. Oh God, the thing just visually inverted on me. It's the weirdest phenomenon. Ah, close your eyes. Um, the launches. Okay. Launches you can rotate right that. here. You got okay. at the bottom. You can rotate that. From there. Here's here's the here's the switchbacks on the way up. This is the road up. There's the. No, that's still good. No, don't do that. Hang on, bring back. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay, let's just leave it yeah. there. That's yeah, good. no, rotating was right. not a success. Here's here's, here's the switchbacks right here on the road up. You know, this is this is the road, right? Okay, the the uh, the landing zone is here. Right. This is the farmhouse, and you can't see, you can't see really, you know. Oh, here's the road. Here's more road. Well, the good reference is the 1500. Yeah, switchbacks. Right. Here's the top. Right. There's the launch. Okay. So the thing is, if the wind is kind of like this, then that the and there's a bit of lapse rate. Then the, then the ridge can actually get ridge sorable. That's where people end up going back and forth, like this. Um, the trick is that it goes up and it goes down. It'll cycle up and people will climb two, three hundred feet above launch and they're going back and forth and back and forth and it'll cycle down and they'll lose five, six hundred feet Then they're three hundred feet below launch and they're toast. They're down in the landing zone. Um, so the big trick is to get away from the hill, find a thermal and go round and round and round and get a thousand feet over launch. So when it cycles down, you end up down, you lose 500 feet, you lose 700 feet, you're still above launch. You know, you're not way down here. Um, so, the other thing that happens is that if it is flowing, you know, this direction right here, then that part of the ridge is sorable. On the other hand, a lot of times it'll blow like this, like, like almost southeasterly. And when that happens, um, it's blowing straight along the ridge. You end up launching off the south end here, and this part of the ridge really isn't soarable. And the part that happens is kind of the, this is the 300 foot right here. That's the 600 foot. And then there's this 1200 foot bowl here. That's the part that's soarable. Don't tell them that. <laughs> it's a secret. I got that all to myself most of the time. Well, I know, but you go down there and it's soarable down there. And then the game with there is, well, see if you can, if you can uh, find yourself a little thermal floating through and climb up over launch. Um, and, but the thing is, is that the trick with the thermals is this, this diagram here is, <coughs> this is, this is the shape, right? You know, and it could be a hilltop, right? Or it could be a wing, who knows? But the air does the same thing, right? Over the, the hill like this, it's going faster. And then as you get a little bit farther away from the wing of the hill, it slows down. And then this is kind of like the, the free stream uh, airspeed right here. And what happens is this increase in velocity, if it's a wing, it makes a lot of lift, um, which is a good thing. On the other hand, if it's a hill, it's really not a good thing because first, it makes it harder to launch because it's blowing harder. But the second thing it does is it puts a lot of wind shear and uh, wind gradient in the thermals. Because the thermals will be going round and round out in front, and then they'll get into this wind field and it'll tilt them really badly. And so they get really elongated and really tilted and really not very workable. You know, they, they sort of get to this point where you kind of hang point it into the wind, point it into the wind, and then you go, okay, I'm about to fly out of it, and then you go, time to turn, and then you just turn around as quick as you can and get pointed back into the wind, and if you're down here, it could have so much shear and be tilted so badly that as hard as you try to turn, you just fall out the back of it, and it just doesn't work. And so the solution to that is rather than fall out the back of it and end up down behind the hill and floundering, what you do is you kind of do S turns in it, you know, maybe climb a little bit and try to sidle out away from the hill. Because the thing is, if you can get out here where the thermals are rounder, you know, use one to kind of S turn in, get a little bit higher, and then get out in this one 
where you can 360 in it, and if you're if you're drifting over the hill high enough, so you're up here, it'll stay around. You can keep climbing away. And you know, if you do that enough, you'll get a sense that well, you know, this one I'm in right now, it's not strong enough. You know, I'm not climbing enough, it's not strong enough. When it goes over the top of the hill, it's just going to be blown to bits, and I'm going to bail out of it before that happens. And then you go upwind, and then you might find another one, you go, oh yeah, I'm climbing better in this one. This one's rounder, and so by the time I get to the hill, I'm going to be high enough that it might tilt a little bit and shear a little bit, but it's still going to be workable and I can keep going with it. Um, that's one of the big secrets. Is kind of get away from the hill and find one that's round. Here's one of the things that, that actually happens is that um, that typically the way the fronts come through is they tend to blow southwesterly, and then when the front comes through, it tends to go northwesterly. And one of the things that actually happens is on an unstable day, the let me draw another little diagram here, is you've kind of got the, the mountain like this, and I'll kind of draw this really, you've got Mission is kind of over here, you've got a couple ridges, and then Ed Levin is kind of shaped like this. And then I know this is a really, really crude drawing, we'll put some towers on it, whatever. Another ridge here, maybe 1,200 foot here. And what happens is, is that the air will come around like this, and then it'll come back together on the lee side of the mountain. So what you'll have is, is the air will kind of split around the ridge, and then on the lee side of the ridge, it'll come back together. And the interesting thing, and this has actually happened to me uh, a couple or three times I can remember, I take off launch, go by the rock pile, try to go north, flounder around in these canyons, just not make it. I ended up fleeing back here and end up somewhere over the 1200 foot hill and then find a thermal and climb out and end up way over launch and then be on top of the ridge and have that actually work. So it'll, it'll converge, you know, sort of behind the mountain, which is kind of a, you know, you wouldn't expect to find lift when, it's, when the wind is actually starting to blow like this. You know, it's already gone northwest and then you're finding lift on, you know, kind of the, the lee side of the 1200, it's sort of a sort of a weird thing because it's it's kind of in the wind shadow of the mountain where the air is converging. Another convergence thing that happens, this is kind of a kind of a summertime thing, is that typically in the summertime it'll blow southwesterly in the morning, fairly light, um, you know, five maybe ten, and then in the afternoon it'll switch northwesterly. And what happens is is that the the hill's heating up in the morning, so it's blowing up the hill. You know, so you've got this kind of southwesterly flow going up the hill, and then in the afternoon, the air further inland is heated up and kind of gone away, and so the wind starts to blow through. So you've got this flow going up southwesterly, and then you've got this northwesterly stuff kind of trying to push it out of the way, and so you've got wind blowing here and wind blowing there, and this and this sort of convergence line will go through and I, I haven't really seen the hang gliders do much with it because it's kind of like little bubbles of thermals and stuff like that, but I've seen the paragliders end up flying for an hour in it, just kind of floating around because they, you know, it's like they they don't have to go anywhere. They can just park, right? The very first hang glider flight I had in Ed Levin was in the Sea Breeze front. I'm just going, what does everybody complain about this place? This is great. Flew for an hour. Yeah. And then there's, and then there's, we've seen convergences that are, are kind of larger scale things where we'll have like northeasterly versus southwesterly in a good lapse rate, and, and then people get unbelievably high, like, you know, into, into DC. Yeah, we're talking into the San Francisco class B airspace on it. Which is, well, well, you're used to the tower, it's not, you're not in the DC. Yeah, the, the, basically, the, well, it's really, I think it's towers over a mission, and the way to imagine it is, you know, from the towers, you kind of draw a line straight towards San Jose Airport, and west of that line, the floor of the San Francisco Class B is 6,000 feet, and east of the line is 8,000 feet. 
halfway between the towers to the bend in 680 where it bends back to the north. I measured it the day after the day we were getting up to 75. Oh. Exactly halfway between the two tall towers to the bend in 680. Which is yeah. pretty far back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well that's, that's, that's the, the time-honored classic strategy of doing it is to launch fairly early at 11 and then be thermaling at 11 and, and you'll be in thermals and you're, you'll be drifting like this. Right, and then find another one, and you'll be drifting like that, and then find another one, you'll be drifting like that, and then find another one. And as soon as you notice that you're drifting away from mission, it's time to jam for mission. Because it's started to shift. You're, you're saying no. Seems like it'll be too late. Um, I, I, I'd start a little bit before then. Well, you could. Yeah. yeah. As, soon as, as soon as you can, you can pick up on that shift. So, so it seems like most of the ones I've done, I've done fairly recently. It's been, it's been already north, and you just take off and find something that's coming out of these canyons and get up in that and go. You'll be, you'll be thinking, oh, I'm having to penetrate to get on the other side of this ridge, and so if I can just get on the other side of the ridge, it'll be blowing up, and everything will be fine. And then you get on the other side of the ridge, and what happens is, is that you're kind of in a situation like this. Where the ridge, the ridge is, you know, it's kind of like this, right? You draw a few contours, right? And you're here, and the wind where you're you're at is like this, right? And you're thinking, well, if I could just get around this ridge, you know, it'll be blowing in like that, and everything will be fine. Well, you get around on the other side of the ridge, and you find out, no, over here it's blowing like this, you know. And that's that's a sign that there's there's not really that much lapse rate. You know, there's enough that, that maybe you can get up in a the thermal, but it's not a huge lapse rate. On the other hand, if there's like enormous, ginormous, incredibly good lapse rate, you could find the wind be blowing up on both sides of the ridge. You know, it's blowing up on this side, and it's blowing up on that side, and it's basically just going up. I mean, I've, I've had days like that where you could, you could launch it at 11 and just fly over to Mission. You didn't really have to turn and do anything. No greater days. Well, yeah, those, those could happen. You know, some, you know, some days it's easy, and some days it's, it's a little more sketchy. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really about lapse rate. And, and you know, my, my experience with Ed Levin is, is it's an inland thermal site. You know, it does occasionally get ridge sorable, but, you know, mostly... What makes it work is turning and turning and turning, going round and round and round and round. I saw, I saw a pilot many years ago as I was driving up, and the cliff not too far from the road off to the right. The pilot was circling and apparently ridge soaring that cliff, and he was just circling around and around and around and around, and the, it was just looked like a total waste of time because. He wasn't ever going to climb out, and I, I think he must have been ridge soaring that lift. Is, is that ever done? Well, uh, I've spent a lot of time, you know, going round and round, or kind of going back and forth like this, thinking, well, I'm not really going up, but on the other hand, I'm not going down. And if I was doing anything else, I'd probably be going down, and that would be really bad. And so sometimes. You get in a state where, you know, if you're if it turns southeasterly, and you end, end up stuck on the 1,200 foot hill, kind of kind of going back and forth and back and forth. Well, maybe the best thing to do is just go back and forth, be patient until maybe it turns a little more westerly, or maybe a thermal comes through. Because if you kind of run out of patience and start searching around for something else, uh, maybe it's not out there. One of the things I've seen, though, is that, is that people will launch off the top and they'll ridge soar a little bit, and then it's kind of not really working, and then they'll end up trying to basically ridge soar and ridge soar and ridge soar. And my experience has been that's a pretty quick route to the landing zone because if it's if it's not quite ridge soarable at the top, if you get down below the top, it's not going to be ridge soarable at all. No, I've I've seen times when you know five minutes made a difference. I mean, I've seen times when, when people ended up over the landing zone, you know, 600, 800 feet over the landing zone, sink out and land. Somebody else arrives, 
five minutes later, and then they find something and get back up. So if it's, you know, if you can just hang on. Um, the other thing that, that I'll tend to do is I'll ridge soar it, you know, trying to find the thermals coming through. But if I start sinking below, if I get, you know, here we have the, uh, the road on the way up here, right? I'm going to leave before I get down to the road. I, I don't even bother ridge soaring it as far down as the road. If I get, you know, halfway down to the road, I'm just going to blow it off and, and get some ground clearance and try to find a thermal. Because the thing is, is that if it's not ridge soarable, that means that the wind is kind of dying. Well, that it may be dying because there's a big thermal lifting off out in front of the ridge somewhere. Um, and the other thing is, if it's windy, the thermals tend to get blown apart, but if the wind is dying, then they're not blown apart, and they kind of stay rounder and more coherent. So, you know, rather than try to find ridge soarability, if I'm sinking off the ridge, I'll, I'll head out and get some ground clearance and see if I can find something I can turn in. <clears throat> and I've, I've had that work a number of times. It's worth mentioning, I had a flight a while back, and I took off. A little, little gust line rain, just started to rain, took off. All I wanted to do was get down on the ground. Everybody flushed, left me with a little bit of ridge lift, played for a little bit, quit raining. Bladder dried off. But this rain and this cold air that came through cooled everything off. And as I sank out on my sled ride, I noticed that the trees were short. The cold air that blew through that cooled everything off, it wasn't enough to penetrate those valleys. Uh, I was halfway down and I noticed it. I went, yeah, ooh, and you could hop from all those clumps of trees. It was easy. You could just, there was thermals coming off because of that reason. It was amazing. Because there was just warm air kind of trapped in there. There wasn't enough wind to blow the warm air up underneath those trees. It left right. the thermal in the flaps rate. Right. It was right. amazing. I hope it happens to you something. Right. Like and the, and the, the trees kind of, kind of kept the ground just a little bit dry and a little bit warmer. Yeah, everybody thought I was nuts. I landed yeah. in the trees. Yeah, everybody thinks you're trees nuts. Are <laughs> <laughs> Don't pay any really attention fun. to them, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It could, you know, I mean, you could go out there the next day and it could be all different. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're they're asking about my my. They want to know what's the strategy for flying a golden eagle. Well, my strategy is that I'll launch and then, well. I might climb right out there, or I might go, you know, north, or basically I'll launch and then just kind of deal with what happens. Turn in lifts, is that it? Yeah, that always helps. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's, uh, let's have a club meeting. Great, let's give them the clap. T2s were like this, right? No, no. Oh, yeah. but they're like this. <laughs> the light speed, since I had a light speed for years, they're like this. Uh huh. Right. That's how the light sport is, too. They don't have, they have like, like, uh,